You've known for years that this is the number one cause of lung cancer, smoking. That's why the Surgeon General issued this warning. But do you know the number one cause of lung cancer for non-smokers? It's in this room. You can't see it or smell it. It's radon. Radon is an invisible radioactive gas that seeps inside your home from underground. It can build up to dangerous levels without notice. Now the Surgeon General has issued another lung cancer warning. And whether you smoke or not, breathing radon can cause lung cancer. That's why you need to have your home tested. Protect your family. Call 1-800-SOS-RADON. Heed the warning, have your home tested, because radon problems can be fixed. Creative artists can transfer your 8mm, Super 8mm, and 16mm films, as well as converting your VHS, CVHS, 8mm, and Mini DV to DVD. Preserve your family's video history for the generations to come. Creative Artists, 1113 West Spring Street, Monroe, 770-267-7368. Dr. Lim is joining us from Walton Pulmonary and Sleep Medicine, which that's Dr. Juno. Some of you guys might know him or be familiar with him. Um, Dr. Lim is a pulmonologist and a critical care specialist. He's also board certified in internal medicine. Um, so there's really not much that Dr. Lim can't handle. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he and his wife, Abby, and their two, two, is he two yet? Yeah, two. And their two-year-old son, David, just moved here earlier this summer. And we're so excited to have them as part of our community and as part of our hospital. Um, and just as part of our family, really. And um, so I'm glad that you guys are here to listen to him today. Their office is located in Loganville off of Highway 81, um, just down from Meridian Park there. So if you're familiar with where that is, you kind of know where they are. Um, but I'm going to let him just kind of take over, and we're going to be talking a little bit about pulmonary health and pneumonia and flu and all that kind of stuff. So, Dr. Lim, have at it. Thank you very much, Emily. You're welcome. Right. Thank you. Uh, so, um, first of all, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming uh, to this um, um, lunch and learn session for today. Um, I know it's very cold outside, but um, but uh, thanks for taking time um, to be here, and uh, I hope you're, everyone's enjoying their lunch uh, right now. So, um, Emily already told you um, told you a little bit about me. Um, just a little bit brief background. I'm um, I, I I originally I, I'm originally from the Philippines. Um, and I came here, um, I, I went to New York City, uh, did my training for, for my internal medicine and for my pulmonary and critical care um, um, subspecialty. And after that, I came here, I joined um, Dr. Juno's practice at Walter Pulmonary. So, um, so that's a that's, um, so, um, short introduction uh, uh, about me. So today we're going to talk about um, I would say a very important um, illness that affects a lot of people. Um, could be children, could be um, um, uh, people who are uh, of uh, older age, or could be anyone uh, that 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 we know uh, could be affected by this disease. Or I would say these two diseases that I'm going to be going through uh, a little bit more in detail later. Um, so I'm pretty sure a lot of you were know someone who may have had pneumonia one time or another in their lives. So, um, and pneumonia can be a very, very ser serious illness. And um, in fact, pneumonia uh, can kill. Um, I don't know if you've known anyone who maybe died of pneumonia or from the complication <coughs> of pneumonia, but it can be a very serious illness. And basically what pneumonia is, is infection of the lung, specifically the the, I would say the meat of the lung. Um, I normally put pictures in, 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 my, in my presentation, but I know this is uh, a lunch session, so I tend not to put anything <laughs> that could um, disturb the appetite. So, um, but just just let you know, it's, it's, it's an infection of the, uh, of the, I would say the meat of the lung. The lung has air tubes, and that, when, when that gets infected, we usually call that bronchitis. But 
if the actual meat of the lung itself is, is, is infected or diseased, um, then that's what we call pneumonia. And pneumonia comes in a lot of different types. It could be caused by um, bacteria, viruses, or even fungi, or fungi, or, um, or, or basically any, any, any microorganism, any bug out there can cause disease or infection in the lung. And again, as I said, it could be a, can be a very serious illness and could also be fatal at times. Now, um, I'm pretty sure a lot of you are familiar with, with some of the symptoms of pneumonia. Um, most of the most common symptoms are fever, chills, um, cough. Cough could be with phlegm or without phlegm. It could be just a dry cough. Some people can have um, pain, chest pain, when you, when you take a deep breath. And that, it's a, ma it's a manifestation of a complication of pneumonia. Um, when people get pleurisy um, or inf inflammation of the lining of the lung, that can cause this pain that I, that I wrote down there, pain when you take a deep breath. And that's because the, the pain that you feel or the pain that is felt is because of the inflammation of the lining of the lung itself. Now, um, fast heartbeat, especially if, if, if you're very sick, or if, you, if you have a high, high fever, or if you have heart problems, it can cause your heart, um, heart disease to, um, uh, to flare up or to, or to worsen. It could manifest a fast heartbeat. And, uh, and, and, if you have, um, and if people have underlying lung problems like COPD or emphysema or chronic bronchitis or asthma or any kind of lung problem to begin with, they, their, their breathing can, can, can actually get worse by the pneumonia itself. Now, um, now, when should I see a doctor for pneumonia? I would say, if you, if you think you have pneumonia, you should go see your doctor. But in what cases, let's say, you get, your, your doctor starts giving you treatment, and let's say you see your, host, your, your doctor in the, um, in, the, um, in the clinic, or maybe you come to the emergency room to see the emergency room physician for symptoms suggested of, um, that are consistent with pneumonia. And usually what, what we do, what the physicians will do, will um, obviously um, talk to you, um, do, a, do, a, do, a, do a thorough examination. And then sometimes, but we, sometimes um, just by, by, by listening to your story, by the doing the exam, we can, we can tell that there's a pneumonia going on. Uh, but a lot of times, to be sure, we also do an x-ray to see if there's any, anything, uh, anything to suggest uh, that, that a pneumonia is going on. So once we see, once we have, once we have a good story, when, once we have a compatible <coughs> physical exam, and once we have um, an imaging or an X-ray that that shows pneumonia, then we start treating with antibiotics. And antibiotics will will depend on, or the type of antibiotics that we give will depend on what kind of bug we think is causing the pneumonia, and depending on what are the underlying problems that, or medical problems that the patient may have. Now. The slide that I put here is basically what should prompt you to come back right away. Um, again, when you when you feel if you think you have pneumonia, you should go see your doctor because that's the only time. I mean, that's the only way that you'll be able to find out if you truly have pneumonia or not, and so that you can be treated sooner rather than later. Now, uh, what the slides here says is what to watch out for while you're on treatment. So you, your, your doctor prescribes you antibiotic or some other treatment. Now what should you watch out for uh, and what are the things that should prompt you to come back right away to see your doctor? So first of all, cough not getting better. So let's say you've been, you've been getting your antibiotics for two, three days now, but, if, but the cough is still there or you're still bringing up a lot of phlegm or let's say you start coughing up blood, then that's one thing that you have to come back to see your doctor right away. Your breathing, let's say you start off with just a cough, phlegm, no problems with breathing. But when you start having problems with your breathing, then make sure you do come back right away because it could be a sign that either the pneumonia is not getting better or whatever, let's say if you have an underlying lung problem, your lung problem is, is flaring up because of the pneumonia. Uh, fever not coming down despite being on antibiotics for two to three days. Usually. When you're started on antibiotics, if you're on the right anti antibiotics, usually by the second, third day, your fever should start coming down or, sh or, or you should start feeling better overall. Uh, now, if you start having chest pain, when you, when, when you, when you breathe in, 
uh, during the course of your treatment it means that there's possibly a complication going on or, 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 or developing due to the pneumonia. So that, or if you didn't have chest pain initially, but you started having chest pain while you're getting treated, then you have to come back and see your doctor right away. Um, now, let's say if you're someone who has um, a weakened immune system or someone with, with, a, with a chronic lung problem, then uh, you have to come and see your doctor, I would say, earlier, sooner than later, if you, if you, have, if you start having any problems. Other, other reasons to come back to see the doctor is that, you, let's say, you start having side effects from, 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 from the medication, from the antibiotics. Common side effects are allergic reactions um, or sometimes stomach upsets, um, sometimes could be diarrhea also. So those are the things that, um, that you should watch out for whenever you're on or antibiotic treatment. Now, um, I mentioned there you should see your doctors when you feel the worst after a cold or the flu. We'll go back to that later on when we um, uh, talk about the flu. Uh, basically, um, just as a brief overview, basically what that's, that, uh, that line says that uh, pneumonia can be a complication of the flu or by a, or, or, or the common cold can, can, can precipitate or can be complicated by a flu. Now, I already mentioned this uh, earlier, uh, how, can, or how is pneumonia treated? So basically it's antibiotics to treat the, um, to, to kill the bugs that are causing the, um, the, the infection. It could be uh, antibiotics kills your bacteria, antivirals uh, for, let's say for pneumonia or for some other bizarre forms of um, pneumonia. Uh, and then aside from that, obviously um, staying at home, rest, um, try to try to tr take a lot of fluids, try to eat as much as possible. Um, uh, so those are basically simple, st simple things that can be done at home. Now, pneumonia can also be, now where you, sh you should be treated for pneumonia will be decided by, by your physician. If, if you're someone who's relatively healthy to begin with, who can take medications by mouth, maybe we can take care of you at home and you can uh, uh, take your medications at home, recover at home, and, um, and, and, and when you're better, your doctors will usually have you come back, let's say, in a week just to make sure that you're feeling better. Now, when do we, when do physicians um, admit you to the, to the hospital for pneumonia? Usually it's when you're, when you're someone who is uh, a little bit uh, older, I would say, I mean, there's really no, no, no cutoff. I mean, we could have like a 90-year-old who's running marathons, have a pneumonia, and we could say, okay, you're, you're, we treat you for pneumonia, you can go stay at home. But if, let's say if you're like a 70-year-old with a lot of medical problems, a lot of complicated, let's say, heart disease, lung disease, usually we, we like to admit them to the hospital just because they tend to get complications much easier, even with a slight pneumonia or a very mild pneumonia. So those. Those, I mean, those those factors we, we I mean, take into account when, when deciding whether you, you can stay home uh, to be treated for pneumonia or you should stay in the hospital for to be treated. I mean, uh, another thing that we obviously that that comes into mind is that let's say you're just so sick you can't take you're, you're vomiting, you can't take in, you can't take anything down. Then you have to be admitted to the hospital to get IV antibiotics. So that's usually the the, the times when, when we actually want patients to be admitted to the hospital for a pneumonia treatment. Uh, now, how can we prevent pneumonia? Um, one thing that we could do, first of all, we'll, we'll go back to that later, is to prevent you from getting the flu, but we'll go back to that later. Another thing that, that I'm pretty sure um, a lot of you might have been offered or maybe already had, had it um, um, or had taken it is the pneumonia vaccine. Now, what, does the, what is the pneumonia vaccine? It's a, it's a vaccine that protects people from the most common type of pneumonia. And that's what we call the pneumococcal pneumonia. Now, again, as I said, pneumonia can be caused by a lot of different bacteria uh, or viruses or, or other kinds of, of bugs. But this type of pneumonia caused by the bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae, I would say it's one of the more um, uh, fatal. If you get it, it can, it can be potentially fatal compared to the other bugs that, that cause pneumonia. So we tend, and this is well, one of the more common bugs that cause pneumonia. So that's why, um, that's why uh, there's a vaccine for it, is to prevent people, first of all, from getting the pneumonia due to this specific bug, 
and also f it prevents you from having a bad case of, a, of the pneumonia caused by this um, bug. And it can also protect you from getting the complications related to having this type of pneumonia. Now, um, I'm pretty sure a lot of you have been told or you may have met someone who might have told you, oh, I got the pneumonia vaccine, but I still got the pneumonia. Um, so why, why, why is that? Um, so again, this particular vaccine, the pneumococcal vaccine, only protects you for this certain type of pneumonia. The other types of pneumonia, I mean, we don't have any vaccines for it. I mean, there's, there's one for, for another kind, but it's usually given for children. But specifically, this will only protect you against one type of um, pneumonia, the pneumococcal pneumonia. Now, this bug has a lot of different forms too. And the, 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 the pneumonia vaccine that's available out there can protect you against either the seven most common or the 23 most common types of variations of this kind of bug. And there's a lot of other variations out there too. So it, doesn't, it's, it does not really protect you 100% but it protects it against the most common types of the pneumonia bug that can cause this type, that can cause this potentially fatal pneumonia. Now, the other good thing about this pneumonia, even though it does not protect you from all of, all, all, the, all of the different strains of this bug, it can lessen the severity of the pneumonia. So if you, even though you got the pneumonia due to this bug, it won't cause that, it won't, um, produce or it won't result in a lot of complications or it won't uh, result in a lot, in a lot of um, illness. So it somewhat lessens the, the, the degree of severity of the illness and also it protects you or prevents you from getting other complications related to, um, to this kind of pneumonia. And um, that's why we do recommend this um, to, um, to, um, to people. Um, now, this is a long list. You, I mean, you don't have to know this, uh, but the most important thing probably is that once you reach the age of 65 and above, you should definitely get this pneumonia vaccine. Why? Because <coughs> people, uh, or studies have shown that people who are 65 and above, uh, when you get the, this kind of pneumonia, you, you tend to get a lot more complications or the chance of, of, of dying is higher from the pneumonia. So 65, and a lot of times people who are 65 and above, I mean, will have a lot other, a lot more um, uh, chronic medical illness with them, and also can also, um, and their immune system are not as, it's not as <coughs> strong as when you were younger. So six, definitely 65 and above, you have to get um, the pneumonia vaccine. Um, now the other things here basically are, are stuff that we, we, we that we, um, for, for other patients, uh, who have like ear implants, who have leaking brain fluid, people with, uh, with, with, with uh, basic immuno, um, su in suppressed or compromised immune systems, that be like people with AIDS or people with, who are on dialysis, people who <coughs> had a transplant, um, whatever kind of transplant that might be, could be um, organ transplant, could be, uh, uh, could be bone marrow transplant. So, or any kind of disease that could potentially cause your immune system to become weak, such as cancer, or widespread cancer, or lymphoma, or leukemia. Um, so those are the things, or, or if you're on medications that could uh, potentially weaken your immune system, such as if you're um, on <coughs> prednisone or steroids for long term, then that can potentially weaken your immune system, then you have to get the pneumonia vaccine to prevent you. Or if, you have, or if you are someone who doesn't have a spleen. Um, a spleen is one of our organs that, that is uh, it's, it's very important uh, for immunity. Some people um, may have no spleen because of maybe in the, in the, in the past, as a young, I mean, when they're young, they had an accident, ruptured their spleen, their spleen had to be taken out. So um, some people can have no spleen or people with um, sickle cell disease, they tend, their spleen tend to not function well. So those are the, some, some of the other type of patients who need the pneumonia vaccine. But, I mean, you don't have to know this, but the most important thing is that if you know someone who, who, who reaches age 65 and above, then they should get the pneumonia vaccine. Um, so again, if you're not sure, always ask your physician about their advice in terms of um, uh, if you should get it or not. Now, um, there's a lot, there's, again, the pneumonia vaccine also comes in two types, which type you should get. 
your physician will be the best one to, um, to, uh, to, to, to determine that. But at least um, just to tell you briefly, um, right now the, the recommendations have changed recently. And right now they're actually recommending two types or you get two forms of pneumonia vaccine when you hit the age of 65. There's a lot of, um, I mean, little nuances, details to that, but um, I think the best person to ask that will be, should be your primary care physician or whoever is taking care of you, um, uh, taking care of your health. Okay, so that's basically the, uh, the pneumonia part of, um, of our session today. Um, before I proceed further, uh, any questions from the group? So is that Medicare approved? Pneumonia, yeah. It yeah. Okay. It is. And there's two, two separate types a physician might recommend? Yeah, there's... It used to be just one, uh, but the, the most recent guidelines that, that came out um, is recommending that that everyone age 65 and above get these two types of vaccines. Um, and the reason that, and their reason was that um, they've been studies showing that it's actually much more effective if you get two of both of them better than just one. Um, now, obviously, guidelines will depend on. I mean, guidelines are, are general guidelines, so. Uh, some people may benefit from it, some people may not, but it will depend on how your, 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 your physician will think about in terms of how you are and what other medical problems you may have. If we don't have a primary care physician, can we come to you for the job? Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, that's, that's, uh, as long as it's available in the office, I mean, we, 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 we do offer it also. You mentioned in the uh, mm -hmm. outline there, kidney disease mm -hmm. as a possible reason. Mm -hmm. uh, probably a lot of us are diabetic. Mm -hmm. Does that uh, change anything you said? Well, um, in terms of being that being diabetic, being a diabetic um, also puts you at risk for getting this kind of pneumonia. Okay. So um, if you're a diabetic, and if let's say if your di diabetes is um, is let's say uncontrolled, or <coughs> or if you or, or if you already have complica complications due to diabetes, then I would still I would highly recommend it. That uh, that you get it um, just because your immune system is relatively weakened by by the diabetes. I've used my endocrinologist in Spelbo for many years mm -hmm. as my personal primary, primary care. Mm -hmm. She's retiring at the end of December. Okay. So I'm going to be lost now until I find somebody new. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll ask you for recommendation uh, later. And I think that we may have one in Loganville, uh, a, a, a group where at least one is endocrinology. Mm -hmm. I think that they may be related to each other. Mm -hmm. Several doctors in one practice. Okay. Okay. All right, so it is important uh, if you're diabetic. It is, it is shot. important. It, it, is, it is important, especially um, uh, uh, just because if you're diabetic, you tend to have other medical problems associated with it. And, and it, as you mentioned, sir, um, kidney, kidney disease could be a problem. I mean, just having some mild kidney problems uh, is not too much uh, for worry, but I mean, if, if, you're, if you're someone on dialysis, then definitely you should get it. There's no question. But, uh, and then being a diabetic also puts you at risk. So um, I, would, I would still recommend it okay, um, regardless. Any questions, sir? I heard some um, conflicting discussion. Mm -hmm. I had a pneumonia shot, and I'm not sure what year, but I was probably about 60. I would have to go with 65. Mm -hmm. uh, 66, they made somewhere in there. But uh, should, I, should I get another one? I, that's been over 25 years ago. Over 25 years, OK. Well, right now, the recommendation is that um, if you get it after, once you get it after 65, that should be it. Um, however, when you got it, how old are you, sir, right now? I'm 91. 91, okay. I mean, the recommendations 30 years ago or 25 years ago might be different from what they are right now. That, that was the basis of my question, really. Yeah, so uh, I think it, it's... That's a long, that's over 25 years ago. I, I, yeah. The, exactly, and I, I'm not even sure if they had that that strong or strict recommendations back then. I'm pretty sure they, they already have it. That's why I mean that's probably why you, why you got it. Now, um, if you go to see your primary care physician, what he or she may say is that uh, you may may need it, or you may need the other one, based from the new recommendations right now, uh, or she, he or she may say you're you're you're, you're good. You don't need it. It, it, it depends a lot on, 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 on a lot of physicians may say um, if you're relatively healthy, maybe one shot, you're good. But if you have a lot of other medical problems that can put you at risk, then maybe having another shot, I mean, it won't hurt you. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I mean, I mean, 
uh, I would say having one more shot just um, first of all for peace of mind and also to make sure that um, that you don't get another don't get a, bout, a bad bout of pneumonia I think there's there's really no no downside to it if you get a, an extra dose so how um, long ago did they change that recommendation so if you've already had a pneumonia shot but you say there's a new one that mm -hmm. covers more well there I mean there's always been two um, the one is usually given for children and one's usually for adults but um, I mean it's it's a very if you look at the guidelines I mean even I when I read it is that mm, it's, it's it's very confusing it's very complicated so they will they will tell you that for a certain age you have to receive this for a certain age you receive this so it could be one both or either or either one now this recommendation is to keep on changing uh, I'm not can't remember exactly when it was last changed but if I if my memory serves me right I would say within the last year it, it was just changed it used to be you only get one vaccine um, after 65 and that's it but now they're, re they're actually recommending two um, um, remember I told you about one vaccine that treat that protects you against seven and then one protects you against 23 so it used to be just like when you hit 65 you get the 23 uh, valent or the, or the one that protects you against 23 but now they're recommending that aside from that you get the one with the seven and they, they, they have a certain um, they, they have a certain recommendation on how long apart you should space this to um, if I'm not mistaken um, <coughs> five years or so but they, they do recommend that you do get both but obviously um, that will be between you and your physician to decide whether you're you're someone who, who should get it and and since these are pretty new recommendations um, uh, unless your physician has uh, updated themselves about that I mean they might still say that you only need one but uh, but um, I mean it's, it's good to ask I mean it helps I mean stir up the discussion and and and, and to keep even us physicians we need to keep up, up updating ourselves so that we're, we're at least in line as to what's recommended out there so we would need to make an appointment with you rather than a nurse to determine which one we need which I, I would say yeah I mean you should go I mean go over this with with um, with a physician because um, I mean there's a lot of nuances into it. I mean unless you're dealing with a nurse who's very, uh, who's very seasoned and, and, and experienced um, about about these things, then um, I mean they themselves could could make that I mean recommendation or, or make that decision for you or help or make that recommendation for you. So um, uh, but definitely this is something that uh, you had to talk about with your physician um, in detail. Okay. Yeah, uh, my wife and I normally do medical things together. Mm -hmm. She has a primary care doctor in Athens. Mm -hmm. So does that mean we couldn't come together and see you and both get a shot? Uh, yeah, you can do, do that, that too. Okay. Or, or you can do it with any 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 primary care physician would have would have this kind of. Uh, I, I had pneumonia uh, and a flu 10, 15 years ago at the same time, and mm -hmm. I had the flu shot. Of course, they don't always get the strain right. Mm -hmm. You know, for what they're predicting about say advance, mm -hmm. but uh, that that was a tough battle. It's the only time in my life I've had mm -hmm. pneumonia. Okay, uh, and I was uh, hospitalized at uh, uh, Eastside at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, uh, I don't I don't know what I've done right since then. We've had a lot of other problems, but uh, pneumonia has not been one of my problems. Okay, that's good. That's good. All right. Um, any other questions? Um, since you mentioned. If there's none, we're going to move move on to the next part of the topic, which is influenza. As you mentioned, sir, influenza earlier. Um, so, influenza. So, flu season is here. It starts usually in November. Um, so, um, it's a very um, pertinent topic um, that we should be talking about. So, what is the flu? Um, so, before I go into the details, Flu comes in again different types. Um, the, the, the flu that we're that we're known or that we're accustomed to or that we that we know about um, is the seasonal flu or seasonal influenza, and that usually occurs uh, in greatest um, um, numbers during the time of November to April, so early, late uh, late fall to early spring. Um, there's a, there's a bird flu that has been um, uh, that has come up in some other parts of the world, not much here in the United States. And then the swine flu, the H1N1, which was um, pretty prevalent, uh, I would say a few years back. And, um, and that 
did cause some problems in some people, especially in children mostly. So, so these are the types of flu that, um, that are out there. But the, the, but the one that is um, much more important for us is the seasonal flu at this time. So what are, what are the symptoms of flu? So again, flu is a, it's, it's, it's a kind of viral illness. Uh, it's caused by a virus, it's, uh, it's called, uh, and the virus is called influenza, influenza virus. And the, again, the influenza virus has different types, influenza A, influenza B, and under that there's a lot of subtypes. Um, but bottom line, it's a viral, it's a, it's, a, it's a disease caused by a virus. Now, what are the symptoms of the flu? Fever, cough, headaches, body aches, sometimes joint aches, feeling fatigue, um, and some people can have some uh, respiratory infect, I mean symptoms like runny nose, sore throat, and a lot of times it may start off with like feeling some, having some runny nose, sore throat, and then after that you start, you started feeling fatigue, and then after that you start developing the fevers. <coughs> then that's when, 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 when you say, when you start saying, oh, maybe I have the flu. <coughs> now, um, a lot of patients ask me, how do I know it's a flu? Or maybe it's just a cold. Um, so this is, this is, a, this is a, I think this is a very nice table I got from um, one of the medical references that, that I use a lot. So looking at cold, I hope everyone can see this, but uh, comparing cold, comparing the common cold with the inf with influenza, usually with influenza you tend to get a fever. With the common cold, not much. Maybe you can get a fever, but only a mild fever. With influenza, you tend to get a higher fever, maybe up to like 100, 102. And it usually lasts for, I would say, three or four days. Headaches, I would say much more common uh, in people with influenza. The body aches and pains, much more prominent or much more um, 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 or much more significant in people with, uh, with, with influenza. Um, the fatigue, the, the, the feeling of exhaustion goes much more with influenza. The stuffy nose, the sneezing, the sore throat, I would say goes more with the common cold, more rather than the influenza, although you can, you can still have those uh, with influenza. And uh, having some chest comfort, coughing, could be uh, could be mild to moderate in people with cold, depending on, on how much um, 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 phlegm you have or how much um, uh, sinus or, 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 or nasal congestion you have. Uh, in the flu, it, it, it's also common to have some some type of chest discomfort, coughing, <coughs> but it can be but it can turn out to be more serious or or, or develop to something more serious. Now, um, why should I be scared of the flu, or why should we should why should we be scared of the flu? First of all, it's highly contagious. So um, if I have the flu, if I start coughing here, maybe half of you will develop the flu later on. So it's very, very contagious. Coughing, sneezing, touching any surface where someone who had the flu was there earlier, maybe somebody was coughing right there, and then, you, and then he left, came and touched it, touched your nose, or put, put something in your mouth, then, Later on, you probably will get the flu. Uh, again, the flu can be very dangerous. It can be fatal. It can be very deadly, especially in, 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 in very, very young people, like children or infants, <coughs> or very older people of, the, of, of el elderly age, or people with, um, with other diseases that can potentially uh, get worse when they have the influenza. So, um, uh, people from the nursing home can 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 get um, can be can um, can get a serious form of influenza. People with heart and lung problems tend to get a more serious form of of influenza just because of the complications associated with it. And people with a weakened immune system tend to get uh, I would say a more severe bout of uh, flu. Again, diabetics just because um, your immune system is weakened by by, by the diabetes can get a, a more uh, serious form of the flu. And as I mentioned here, the flu can cause pneumonia. And the flu m may not be the reason for you being sick or being much sicker, but the pneumonia that's caused by the flu can act eventually kill you or, or kill someone. So, um, so that's the problem, that's, that's the danger with the flu. I mean, you can have the flu and recover from it, but 
and, and recover from the flu. But if you get pneumonia because of the flu, then you're in trouble. So uh, just going back a little bit here, um, the flu virus itself can cause a, a, a form of pneumonia. So that's one thing. Now, how, how does the flu itself cause pneumonia? What happens with the flu, it weakens the, um, uh, the, the protective functions of the lung. So once you weaken that bacteria that's normally in our mouth, in our lungs, then they can start um, 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 uh, wrecking havoc, so, uh, so, so to speak. So, <coughs> so once if the influenza goes in the lung, causes, weakens the lung's ability to protect itself, once you put some bacteria into that, then you can have pneumonia. That's how influenza causes pneumonia. Uh, so it's very important to prevent the influenza prevent you from getting the flu. Now, how do you treat the, the flu? Since this is a viral illness, and a lot of the viral illnesses, just like the common cold, they just go away by, by themselves. I mean, um, rest, fluids, taking some Tylenol or aspirin for, for the fever, for the aches and pains, and obviously seeking medical advice if things are getting uh, worse. Um, a lot of times flu, it's, it's, a, it's a miserable illness, but uh, a lot of times, if you're healthy, you won't do. I mean, it will just make you feel miserable for a few days, and after that, you're okay. But if you're someone who is sick to begin with, give them the flu, then they, they'll end up much, much worse than what they are when, than what they already are. Now, again, when should you call for help? That's I think this is the most important thing. Um, you start. You have symptoms of flu. Okay, I think I'm getting better from the flu. And then suddenly, for, for, for no reason, you start, oh, why am I short of breath? Why am I coughing again? Why am I having fevers again? Why is my chest hurting when I breathe? Why am I coughing up phlegm? Why am I coughing up blood? Or why am I getting confused? Uh, or why, I mean, or maybe your family members notice you acting strange. Then it means that you're having a complication due to the flu. It could be, you may be developing a pneumonia or you could be developing other illnesses because um, now what else um, let's say you have the flu <coughs> your appetite is so bad you can't eat or you're vomiting you feel <coughs> nauseous you can't take anything down then you have to seek medical advice sooner than later because you might end up being dehydrated uh, not being able to, um, to take your medications and you can actually be be much worse okay um, so I think the most important thing here is that we should take away from, from today is how should we, how to prevent the flu. Flu season is here. So um, again, it's not too late to have your flu vaccine. So I always tell, tell my patients, as long as, as, long as we're in, in, in the flu season, get your flu vaccine, because you never know. Even though, we're, we're, let's say, even though it's March or April when flu is almost gone, or when, when, we're, when we're almost out of flu season, you can still get the flu. So being, being ready, or being prepared is actually better. Uh, so, how to prevent the flu? Frequent hand washing to prevent you from um, from getting the, the virus uh, into your into your system. Uh, obviously, avoiding close contact with someone who you think may have the flu. Uh, cover your mouth, mouth or nose when you're sneezing or coughing, so you don't spread it around. And and the best thing is to stay home when you're sick. Try to avoid any. Try to. I mean, this is one thing that you want to, I mean, I mean, generosity is good, but being generous with the flu, it's not a good thing. So, um, and then obviously the flu vaccine, um, which is, I would say, one of the most important aspects of uh, flu, flu prevention. Now, why, why do we need to get the flu vaccine? So it lessens the chance of you getting the flu. As you mentioned, sir, um, every year, there's a new version of the, or every season, there's always a new version of the, of the flu vaccine. And what the reason for this is, is that the, uh, the strains of flu that's going to be out um, circulating differs every year or every season. That's an international decision, isn't it? Exactly. So <coughs> WHO and all other health, I mean, important health agencies, they come together, CDC included, they come together, decide which um, or what they think is going to be the more prominent strains of flu for the, for the upcoming season, and that's when they decide to put those strains into the into the vaccine. So, 
again, it's not 100% that, I mean, that the, the flu vaccine that's, that's out for this season will protect you from all the types of um, flu strains that, that's going to be out during the, during the <coughs> flu or during this flu season. But at least we'll protect you from the, from the ones that are going to be circulating most. Um, now, let's say even though, even though you don't get protected 100%, the good thing about the flu vaccine is, is that in some way it gets the body ready for the flu. So even if you get the flu, even if you get infected with, infected with the flu, your body will be ready to fight it off. So your symptoms won't be as bad and you probably won't be as sick as that long or as long, I mean, as um, longer than, 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 than you should be. So it definitely helps. It helps prevent you from getting sicker, prevents you from getting the complications related to, to the flu. And again, effectiveness, <laughs> as you can see, is 50 to 80%. So it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a perfect vaccine, but it's good enough, I would say, in terms of um, preventing complications. And that's the thing that we want really to prevent. I mean, the flu by itself, doesn't really kill you, but the complications will kill you. So that's what, what we want to prevent. And again, it will give you, or the help having the flu will, will give you, or will prevent you from getting um, sicker, so milder and shorter symptoms. Now, the flu vaccine, uh, the way that it's administered could be through a shot, what we call the intramuscular shot, um, and then there's another form that is given through the nose. Now, um, for, for people who are um, elderly, uh, we don't recommend the um, the spray because the spray the, the, the spray vaccine actually has a live virus in it, um, but it's it's weakened. It's normally <coughs> given to to people age two to forty nine. Um, the reason is that um, people of that age tend to have a stronger immune system, even though you have the live but weakened virus, you you will be able to fight it off, and you will be able to develop the immunity to, to that flu. Are there brands other than thermoflu? Hmm? Are there medications other than thermoflu? I mean, in terms of, well, uh, uh, in, the, in the spray. In, in the spray, um, I'm not sure if there's any other. I'm not that familiar with the with with the flu because I don't personally. I don't usually give it in in, in the. I mean, we don't give it in the practice. Uh, but I'm pretty sure there's at least one or two, um, or at least two um, different brands or companies who who who. who yeah. um, Kroger is offering the high dose this year, mm -hmm. which okay. is recommended, right, for people yeah. who should survive. Exactly. So the high dose is the one that is recommended for people who are 65 what and above. What if you were given more or less the standard dose, mm -hmm. and then they told you about the high dose mm -hmm. after you'd already had the standard? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anything you can do to help protect yourself more? Well, the at the time yeah. when they mm -hmm. did it, it was just a nurse that, you know, you went in for a flu shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, after she had given it, she told me, well, there's another type. Mm -hmm. And that's the type I probably should have had. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, well, you can't do anything about it now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, if you're okay with it, you can always get another shot with a high dose. But... Even with the standard dose, you should be well protected. Even if you have a low immune system. Yeah, it. I mean, the reason for the high dose, as is, I mean, as you're already alluding to, is that it it, it helps your body. Um, I mean, uh, react it, react to the the vaccine better, so you can have better immunity. Um, now, if you're not someone who's I mean, if, you're, if you're not someone whose immune system is weakened, already weakened by other diseases, such as those that I mentioned earlier, being on, uh, being on medication like steroids, or, being, or someone who's on, on who, who has received transplant, or someone uh, who's on dialysis, then oftentimes a standard dose, you can get away with it. I mean, you, know, you, you, you should be good with, with it. Um, if you're relatively healthy, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, I mean, obviously, they, I mean, the recommendation from the high dose obviously comes, comes from, from studies that, 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 that have been done showing that uh, you, you, you probably are better off um, or your, your protection is actually better with a high dose. But even, even with the standard dose, people still get pretty well protected from it. So, um, so don't worry if you, got, if you just got the standard dose, you're, you're still good. Uh, now, if, if you're really worried that, if you're not sure, like, if you think about, like, oh, um, I think I have this, I have that, maybe I should have gotten the, the, high, the higher dose. Now, uh, what I would do is 
go see your your, your, your physician and, and ask your, get their opinion about it. I mean, some I mean, some may say, okay, uh, I think you're okay as long as we make sure that you you do the other things to prevent yourself from getting the flu, then then you should be good. Or we could try to um, treat your other medical conditions better to prevent you from getting sick. So so it will depend. It, it's a it's always a case case basis. I mean, the guidelines are just general things that, that that that's out there for everyone. But when it comes down to each patient, um, I tend to. I mean, most physicians tend to. Do it case by case. So, um, uh, percentage wise, how much stronger is the high dose over the regular dose? Uh, you mean in terms of you know effectiveness or, uh, no, or in, in terms of the strength, strength of the injection? Is um, it like twice the regular dose or fractionally more? Um, I'll I'll have to look that up. Uh, I'm not sure about the exact numbers, uh, but I, I can look it up and I'll, I'll let you know uh, no, before you get it. Yeah, but uh, um, but I I think it's at least one point five. More than the um, than okay. the uh, than the standard dose. Uh, is the uh, the logo there in the lower right hand corner? Is that part of your practice, uh, Walton? About the sleep medicine? This is yeah. That's that's is that that's part of your practice, practice as well. Is, yeah, th th oh, I'm yeah. part of that practice. Right, I have had a common problem. I hadn't thought about it in years, of not maintaining the CPAP machine correctly, mm -hmm. and and I have gotten some nasal infections out of that. Mm -hmm. Is that pretty critical? Did you do all the stuff they say on a weekly basis? Yeah. So <coughs> all the white vinegar and everything. Yeah. As long as you come <coughs> come to our office, we'll we'll, we'll get those things okay, sorted good, out for you. Good. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, so conti to continue, side effects of the flu vaccine it's usually related to the injection itself. Some pain, swelling, or redness uh, on the injection site. It usually goes away by within a day or two. If it if it's if it bothers you, you can take some Tylenol, put some warm compress on that. That should go away in like one or two days. Um, some people can have some of the symptoms similar to the flu, like body aches, headaches, low-grade fever, but that should all should subside uh, pretty quickly. And that's more common, especially if you get the, um, the live vaccine, because the live vaccine actually has the virus itself. The, the, the one that, 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 that's usually given uh, to the rest of the other, to other people, I mean, the, the injection one is, is not actually, there's, there's no virus in it, it's just a, a part of the virus that's there, so it, it can't make you sick. Uh, I mean, it can make you sick in, in, by, by, because your, your body is, 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 is producing or is, is responding or producing in, or it's getting itself ready um, for, for, for the actual flu, so it's just building up its immunity and the way that the body responds is to <coughs> produce fever and, and basically the symptoms that you have there. Um, some people can have allergic <coughs> reactions to the flu vaccine. Uh, but most, mostly with the nasal spray. Um, some people may, tell, may ask me, what if I had the egg, egg, egg allergy? Can I get the flu vaccine? Because um, um, you may or may not know, but uh, the, the, the flu virus or how they culture it is made from eggs. So they, they actually use real chicken eggs uh, to produce the flu vaccine. Now, some of the components of the egg might, might inadvertently go into the vaccine but that should be a problem. But if you're allergic to eggs, that could be a problem. Now, um, the the injection type of vaccine, it's not it's not a problem with people with, with egg allergies. The one that comes as the uh, nasal spray, that's the one that can cause uh, potential problems with, with, uh, for people who have egg allergies. So even if you have egg allergies, you can still get the shot. So um, and and the, and the and the risk of getting an, an allergic reaction. If you have egg allergies from the shot, it's very, very, very minimal. So, um, so I would say the risk of getting the flu is probably much higher than you getting um, um, an allergic reaction because of, a, of an egg allergy. All right, so bottom line, who should get the flu vaccine? Everyone. Everyone for that matter, okay? Um, because, again, if you get sick with the flu, even though if you're healthy, you get sick with the flu, you give it to someone else who's potentially sicker than you, then you give them a problem. If you're, if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent who has a little kid at home, if you get the flu, you give it to them, they could be sick. And they could be potentially very sick, especially if they're very, very young, like an infant or like a toddler. <coughs> so, um, so that's why even though you're relative, I mean, a lot of people will tell me, oh, I'm, 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 I'm in my 30s, I'm in my 20s. I can't get, I mean, I, I can't, I mean, I, I'm okay, I, I can deal with the flu. But you have to think about other people. So it's more of like a public health thing rather than 
um, on, on a personal level, personal health level, it's more of a public <coughs> health uh, issue uh, for everyone to get the flu. So again, just to stress, these are the people who definitely need to get the flu vaccine. Um, so people who are 50 and older, people who live in nursing homes, just because of the, um, the close environment and also because people there are, are, are relatively um, sicker than the rest of the people outside. People with chronic heart and lung problems, people with kidney disease, diabetes, people who had transplants, people who have HIV and, and especially pregnant women uh, should need to get the flu vaccine. And that's it. Um, any questions about the flu? Yeah. Another thing, okay, if you're immune compromised, mm -hmm. are there precautions other than hand washing mm -hmm. that you can take so you can continue to go out in public, mm -hmm. you know, in crowded areas? In crowded areas, so okay. Anything you can do to try to keep you from getting that? Well, um, and not isolating yourself. Um, well, masks that's I mean the mask basically is to prevent you from inhaling anything in, in the environment but most of the time it's you touching a surface or being in or holding something that has anything and you put it into your face or close to your face that's when you actually get it I mean even if you're out there I mean somebody sneezes there <coughs> I mean there may be a chance that some of them some of those air, dro air droplets can get to you but if you're far enough, then that's okay. I would say maybe like uh, uh, six feet away, then that should, should be a problem. Uh, but just to be sure, um, I usually say just put on a mask because you, you, you never know. Especially if you're someone who is very, very, if you're on like very strong immunosuppressive medications, um, then you have to be very, very caref careful out there. Um, I would say try to avoid crowded space, spaces. I mean. You don't want to risk uh, getting sick, especially if you're immunocompromised. So th that's what I w that's what I usually say to my patients who have, who are like post transplants or people who, uh, especially people who had lung transplants, because not only um, because of not only they're immunosuppressed because their lungs are fairly fresh and very um, very susceptible to get sick. <coughs> so um, <coughs> say just try to avoid crowded spaces as much as possible. Uh, I mean, if you can't avoid it, then you have to take the necessary precautions, barrier precautions. Okay. Any, um, any other questions? Uh, anything you want to be clarified? All right, um, if done, then thank you very much for, uh, for your time, everyone. Uh, I'll be ha um, if you have any, have any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them after this session. Welcome to this week's edition of The Health Story. My name is Dee Dee Harris. I'm the Executive Director of Walton Wellness, a nonprofit located here in Walton County dedicated to the prevention of lifestyle-related chronic illness. Each week I like to come to you with some kind of new information that I think might be helpful for you or for someone you love or let you know about some different resources that are available here in our community. And today I'm very excited to be out here in this very chilly November morning to um, introduce to you our latest um, Project Road Share project from Walton Wellness. This was a partnership between the City of Monroe and Walton Wellness to put up this is what we call the Project Roadshare Trailhead. This started in Good Hope, where we put our first edition of Project Roadshare. Then we opened up one last year in Social Circle, and then this year we are very proud to add Monroe to the mix on Project Roadshare. Project Roadshare is a bicycling project that we have here in Walton County, where we put these trailheads up that allows a place for cyclists to park and then um, we want them to be able to have somewhere to get food or water nearby um, and then we invite them into our cities and hopefully we might have cyclists from outside of our city might come in and eat at our restaurants or do a little shopping at our stores but also Walton Wellness obviously is trying to encourage people to ride their bike as a part of a healthy lifestyle. Bike riding is a great way to get in shape, to maintain your shape throughout your life. You can ride a bike from the time you are four 
all the way up to a hundred. Um, a lot of times running and sometimes even walking might become stressful on your joints as you go, get older, but riding a bike is always much easier on your joints and it's something that you can, an activity that you can continue to do through your life. So Walton Wellness is very much an encourager of bicycling as a healthy lifestyle, as a way to get exercise, to be outside. It's also a great activity to do as a family. Um, there's all kinds of places that you can take your bike. Here in Walton County, we actually have really good riding, and that's what Project Roadshare aimed to do, was to highlight the, the great riding that we do have in our community. Even though we don't have dedicated paths to bicycling, we do have some great backcountry roads that are low traffic, beautiful scenery with farmland and pasture land that we do encourage people to stay to those areas of the county. But it's an awesome opportunity to get out and be able to ride your bike. So Project Roadshare's trailhead here in Monroe actually highlights several different things. What I'm standing in front of here, you'll see it says the Historic Wellness Walk. You might be familiar with Walton Wellness's project, Wellness Walks, which we started in downtown Monroe was our first one. And it's a self-guided tour through downtown Monroe that takes you past the historic sites and tells you a little bit about the history of our community. We also have a Wellness Walk that we did in Social Circle that does the same thing. So as part of the uh, Project Roadshare Trailhead on the kiosk, we were able to actually display the map for our wellness walk in downtown Monroe. So if you're in, not a cyclist, but you're interested in walking, you can come here and check out our map and you can be able to see which way our um, wellness walk goes through downtown Monroe. And the city of Monroe is actually working on some improvements that will really highlight the wellness walk through downtown Monroe. Thanks a lot for tuning in today. Uh, as always, we're going to show you some of the dogs and cats here at Walton County Animal Control. I don't have to say it, but of course it's Christmas and so those days are coming up and maybe you want to get a new pet in your house. As usual, we've got our $40 adoption fee. It includes heartworm testing, deworming, microchipping, all kinds of extras for $40. So uh, it's a great way if your kids have been looking for a pet in the new year. Uh, maybe we don't have anything right now that you're interested in, but a good thing to do is uh, buy a collar and a leash, wrap it up, put it in a box, put it under the tree with a note that says, after the holidays, we're gonna bring a new puppy or a new kitten into the house. You know, this is the perfect place to come, just $40. You you don't have to pay a breeder. A lot of the veterinary uh, uh, items are included, the vaccine. So uh, don't forget about the animals that are stuck here at Christmas at Walton County Animal Control. Come on down and adopt today. Uh, we're on South Madison Avenue, right at the intersection of Highway 11 behind the Walton County Sheriff's Office. You can come visit us in the afternoons uh, from 2 to 4.45 to look at the pets that we have and maybe bring one home for the holidays. And so now we're gonna show you some of those that we have here at the shelter. Six month old mix male, very sweet, looking for a good home. Cool. I have here a one or a three year old pit. She's a really sweet girl and she could really use a good home. I have us a good boy here. It's a chocolate cocoa pit, male, about three year old, happy as he can be, love to find a home. We got a uh, female, uh, not spayed, she's probably about five months old, very sweet, she's scared but she's very sweet, needs a home fast. Here we have three little puppies, they're all girls, they are most likely lab and mama is Australian Shepherd mix. Um, they're all girls about six weeks old, so they're ready to go. Well, this is the mama to the three puppies we just saw. Um, she's an Australian Shepherd mix, about uh, probably about a year old. Um, her name is Ladybug. But do you know the number one cause of lung cancer for non-smokers? It's in this room. You can't see it or smell it. It's radon. Radon is an invisible radioactive gas that seeps inside your home from underground. It can build up to dangerous levels without notice. Now the Surgeon General has issued another lung cancer warning. And whether you smoke or not, breathing radon can cause lung cancer. 
That's why you need to have your home tested. Protect your family. Call 1-800-SOS-RADON. Heed the warning. Have your home tested.